Thank you for being here today on a Saturday afternoon. We know there's many other places to be, but this is the place to be. So thank you for being here. I want to remind everybody that we are on a lonely land, and you know, as current caretakers, uh, we should all gather together and commit to care, care for this land. Um, be kind and love one another and know that this is uh, not our land and that we occupy it. So with that, I also want to thank all of our unseen labor here that, that makes everything at the library happen, the backbone of the library, custodial, security, our amazing media services team that really make this library hum. I want to let everybody know that there's lots of library information on the back table. We are giving away a free book today called My Government Means to Kill Me. It is our summertime on the same page, which is a bi-monthly or tri-monthly read that we encourage all of San Francisco to read the same book, same time, and engage with each other. On Wednesday, August 14th, author, our author Rashid Newsom and Andrew Sean Greer, who's a Pulitzer Prize winning author, they will be in conversation on his book, My Government Means to Kill Me by Rashid Newsom. So pick that up, there's copies back there. It is a great read. I missed my bus stop many times reading the book. Um, other happenings, we're having a death and dying series. We have, it is summer stride, so all of that stuff is back there. Library in the summer, that's where it's like we go all out. So if you don't know about San Francisco's summer, you can get an iconic tote bag if you do 20 hours of reading, learning, or exploring. This counts. And the great thing about that is we get to sponsor an amazing artist each year. So Sandy Santa Maria, Cindy Santa Maria was our artist this year, and her work is beautiful, and you can see it everywhere. You saw that big banner as you came in Grove Street. That's her work, and it's on the tote bag. So make that happen, and you can get your tracker back there on that table. I think that's all the announcements that I'm going to give because we're going to turn it over today. And we're really excited about this. I don't know if you all know that San Francisco Public Library has a jail and reentry services department. And so we serve all of the jails in San Francisco. We, our team goes in, brings books, does requests. But we also serve the largest reference by mail, this side of the Mississippi. And then our bridge up on the fifth floor does reentry services. So if you know anybody that needs any reentry assistance, send them here. We're here to help. So today, I'm super excited that we have co-author James Kilgore and Vic Liu, and they're going to discuss their new book, The Warehouse, A Visual Primer on Mass Incarceration. There are some copies up here available, and this event is in partnership with the California Coalition for Women Prisoners. In conversation today, we'll be leading the conversation, Amina Elster, a legal and policy advocate, researcher, facilitator, who's committed to the systemic change in the criminal legal system. She's a black feminist, prison abolitionist, and formerly incarcerated professional. She is also the co-founder and leader of Unapologetically Hers, which focuses on the needs of individuals in California women's prisons via education and advocacy. She amplifies voices using research and lived experience. James Kilgore is a researcher and activist based in Urbana, Illinois. Illinois, Illinois. He's the author of six books, including the award-winning A People's Guide to Mass Incarceration. Four books were written during uh, a six and a half year in California prison. Research fellow at Media Justice. He founded the Challenging E-Carceration Project and is the director of advocacy, advocacy and outreach at First Followers Reentry Program in Illinois. Vic Liu is an artist and author using design to convey complex information with empathy. I love that. They authored Bang, Masturbation for All Genders and Abilities, and they create impactful work for State Department on Syrians' Oppositions Fragmentation. Developed pamphlets on women's workers' rights with the 2020 Center for Urban Pedagogy, Pedagogy, Oh, I'll read good one day soon. Um, designed a toolkit for birth control discussions with Baltimore City Health Department. 
And I just want to give a brief uh, info on uh, CCWP, the California Coalition on Women's Prisoners. They're a grassroots abolitionist organization with members inside and outside of the prison. They challenge institutional violence against women, transgender people, and communities of color. And they focus on dismantling the prison industrial complex. And I'm always happy to partner with them again. And thank you so much. Amina, take it away. Yeah, good afternoon, everyone. Can you hear me? Yeah. Great. Thank you all for being here. Um, I think we want to start with uh, an acknowledgement to Palestine. Right. So is this working? Um, it's very so there's a, there's a demonstration going on as we speak. And so I thought we might give them a chant of solidarity before we start our talk. Is that OK with everybody? So free, free Palestine. Free, free Palestine. Free, free, free Palestine. Free, free, free Palestine. Viva Palestina, viva. Viva Palestina, viva. Viva Palestina, viva. Viva Palestina, viva. Okay, thank you. Thanks, James. All right. So, yes, thank you all again. Um, we're going to just kick off this very robust discuss discussion about The Warehouse, which is a great book. And if you haven't gotten one, I hear that there are copies up here. I recommend you all get one. Um, but for starters, you know, um, either you, Vic, or James, please feel free to answer. The Warehouse uses a visual approach to discuss mass incarceration. Can you explain why you chose this method and how it came about? Like, what inspired you to use these visuals to convey the complex and critical issues surrounding the prison industrial complex, particularly in amplifying the voices and experiences of black and brown communities? Okay. I still don't trust this microphone, but <laughs> it is fine. I will have trust. Um, the warehouse was born about four years ago. Uh, right near the first year of the pandemic, when I read James's oh, fourth book, fourth book, fifth book, okay, fifth book, Understanding Mass Incarceration. Understanding Mass Incarceration is quite special to me because I think that there are very few books within the world of abolition and or understanding the carceral system that provide a wide overview of what is going on in an approachable way. So often you have scholars and academics who do crucial work of breaking down the complex factors or biases or lens that lends, or that lends with a D itself to mass incarceration in the United States, but rarely do you have something that does a comprehensive overview. So when I read James's book, I was like, well, thank God. And then I said, it's really ugly, <laughs> and I think I can do better. So I tracked him down, uh, tracked down his email, his old email, which thankfully he still checked for some odd reason, and cold emailed him, and here we are, uh, years later. But the reason behind design in book form for me, I call it information art, because it's not quite graphic design. It's not the stuff that you find in advertisements that tell you to go buy whatever product with a bunch of lightning bolts and uh, the new version of Comic Sans. Um, James, excuse you. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> and it's not quite art, well, you know, art is subjective, but it's not quite something you'd find in a museum, which is another soapbox that I'll save for later. Oh, yes. You, oh, I see, I see. That is how microphones work. All right. Um, to me, design is one of the most democratic ways and accessible ways to present information. So currently, the United States adults average out to about sixth grade reading level, and that is not because they are by any means stupid it is a very deliberate lack of access to information, which I think compounds inequality in our country. Because when you don't have access to information about the world, how can you possibly navigate it? 
So, well, I mean, you can navigate it, it's just a lot harder. Um, so I, I think it's really important to think about ways to push information sharing beyond text. So we bring in graphics, which can convey so much rich emotion, texture, um, trauma, I intuitively. You don't have to be versed in academic vocabulary in order to understand what is happening. And I think, too, with issues such as mass incarceration that are so bodily felt, there is something horrible about carving out this trauma and experience, processing it into text, and then putting it in these clinically clean text blocks where you only get one image on the cover. That makes it quite inaccessible to the very people it talks about. Can I add a little bit? So, I mean, I want to talk about how I came to want to do a book like this because during my, during my underground times, I spent a lot of that time in South Africa and I worked with trade unions and community organizations that were fighting against apartheid. And a lot of my work there was in, involved popular education. So I, read, I wrote pamphlets and booklets about complex policy issues that impacted the working class post-apartheid South Africa. But these were written for people for whom English was maybe a third, fourth, even fifth language. So I had to think about how I could construct the text and the graphics to, inter to be able to intersect with, with, where, with where people's heads were at because they could, they could fight and they could, they could follow the issues of World Bank policy, International Monetary Fund policy, but not in the language that was used by those institutions. So when I subsequently landed in prison, I got a lot of material sent in to me from people about prisons. And when I tried to share it with people that I was incarcerated with, most of it was inaccessible to them. And so I thought to myself, one of the things I'm going to do when I get out of here is I'm going to take the popular education skills that I learned in South Africa and apply them to writing about mass incarceration. So that's what I did when I did my first ugly book about mass incarceration, which is still more accessible than most books about mass incarceration. But when Vic came with the ideas to amplify the visual element and really you know, completely restructure it, I, 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 was, I was really open to, to seeing if we could make that work, and, and we did. And you know, we worked on this for four years, and we only really met three weeks ago. <laughs> All Zoom. <laughs> That's amazing. Um, you know, James and Vic, your book provides a powerful visual narrative of mass incarceration, evidently. You know, how do you see the intersectionality of race, gender, and economic inequality shaping the history of mass incarceration in the United States? And how do these intersecting oppressions continue to uphold um, the, our system today? I think it's impossible to talk about mass incarceration without acknowledging that it starts in slavery, right? So it goes from slavery to civil rights to the war on drugs to mass incarceration. And it's all one continuum. It's helpful to separate them into their periodic elements. But it, you should not forget that the impact of all of them is to oppress black and brown people in the United States. And it is structurally very clear, right? So the rate of conviction for black people versus white people, the, the representation of black people and brown people and Hispanic uh, people, Latinx, in prison is four, five, and, or four, three, and two, respectively, uh, times that of white, their white counterparts. Parts. And then when it comes to poverty, it's very clear that bail, given how many more times you're more likely to be convicted if you cannot afford the bail to be staying at home versus in jail, it, to me it's like, they didn't even try to hide this shit. Like, it's like very easy to see. So um, just to add a little bit to that, so for me, a lot of people mistakenly think that mass incarceration is about money, that it's about profits, that private companies and private prisons and so forth are the drivers of mass incarceration. And I, I fundamentally disagree with that. I'm not saying nobody's making money off of mass incarceration. Certainly people are, but that's not what drives it. It's a political project. And for me, the, the, 
The real causes of mass incarceration are two that have to do with the structure of racial capitalism. The first one is that mass incarceration is a backlash against the, the mass movements of the 60s and, and, and 70s, led by the black liberation struggle, but also including other struggles for national liberation, other struggles uh, again, against the war and against, against the dominant culture. So when those movements began to decline, the backlash came, just like we're seeing a backlash now against the mass movements that, that uh, took place in the, 20, in, the, in the 2010s and in response to, to George Floyd. So that's the, that's the first point, that it's, a political, that it's a political backlash. And the second point is that it's a product of, of neoliberalism. It's a product of global economic crisis which manifests itself in the, in the US in the, in the form of neoliberalism, which basically in its simplest form means we s slice away the welfare state and we enhance the capacity of the state to punish and to carry out military projects. And so that's why we've seen, that's why we see the, you know, the horrible impact of, of having masses of unhoused people, of having, of having all the, the welfare state provisions stripped back. It's, it, and the, the resources that went into those, uh, into those projects going to prisons and jails. And of course, the biggest public housing project in the last 50 years in the United States has been the building of prisons and jails. I think we should also add that it has also attacked the LGBTQ community disproportionately, right? So um, the, the rate at which trans people are incarcerated is immense. And that relates to income stability, of course, but also just straight bias, so. Absolutely. Um, <clears throat> thank you both. Um, you know, California's history of like forced sterilizations, um, particularly within its prison system, is a profound example of reproductive injustice. Can you discuss this history as presented in your book and its long-term effects on marginalized communities? Like how does this intersect with the broader narratives of mass incarceration and the systemic control of black and brown bodies? I can't speak to California in particular, um, specifically, but I do know that there's a pretty, well, in general, it, the forced sterilization of black and brown bodies has happened in and out of prison, right? So in Baltimore, where I was working, we were talking a lot about how there was a lot of uh, unconsensual sterilization of black and brown bodies when they would come in for a checkup. Um, women would come in for a checkup, be put under, and then wake up sterile. And that continues within prisons, in and out. So I guess for me, it's hard to separate. It, it's just this whole government-wide campaign to project this idea that there are, well, eugenics, right? It's like this idea that there are people who are more capable of caring and loving for their children and reproducing and more worthy. Um, and then, of course, we, we talk a lot about what it's like to have a baby in prison, which, uh, it, it's, it's one of those instances where when you describe what happens when you give birth in prison, y your brain somewhat leaves your body because you can't believe that this hell exists here and that we're paying for it with our taxes. Pregnant women are shackled while giving birth. I, I mean, my sister gave birth about three months ago. I can't believe she did that without shackles. It was a 32 hour labor. Um, the idea of doing that with shackles is one of the most absurd, inhuman, inhumane things I've heard. No one's going to be committing crimes while they're in the throes of labor. So the idea that we feel the need to do that, it, it speaks to the extent to which we are not aimed at rehabilitation in any way. We are aimed at sheer dehumanization, it, honestly beyond punishing people for whatever they did. It's just sadism at that point. And I think part, and one of the things that's important to recognize is how much that is normalized within, within prisons. So, I mean, when you're incarcerated, you get used to being strip searched. That's a sexual assault, but it, it, becomes, it, becomes, it becomes normalized. 
and on on both sides of the of, of both by the staff and by the people who are impacted by that. So these are these are issues that we have to that we have to continually raise and continually push back. I haven't seen I haven't seen anywhere where they've eliminated strip searches. Does that happen anywhere? Is anyone aware of that? It's a sexual assault on every person who's incarcerated, ha and it may happen to you every single day. So it sets the stage to do all the other kinds of things that you're talking about in terms of in terms of childbirth. But I think the I mean then the I mean the other part is just the whole connection between families, mothers in particular, and their children, and the the ways in which the visiting the you know the rules for visiting the ways in which that's structured to make it very difficult for people to sustain any kinds of relationships. I mean, I was relatively fortunate in that I was able to maintain connection with my with, with my with my children and with my partner, but they were in South Africa. So I didn't have that much connection with them and I mean, I had to resort to writing about it in order to keep it fresh in my in order to keep it fresh in my in, in my mind. So there's a whole way in which all of that is taken away from you and you, you have to find ways to push back against it in order to keep, to maintain your humanity. Absolutely, and that brings us to this next question, which is, you know, like in my work around reproductive um, justice and healthcare decision making in carceral settings, we often talk about how survivors um, make meaning in health, illness, and death while incarcerated to enact resistance to medical neglect through trauma healing, caregiving, and medical advocacy. By centering the voices of incarcerated and formerly incarcerated people, our aim is to challenge resilience frameworks that imply marginalized populations ought to accept and survive um, within systemic oppression. Instead, we utilize a resistance, um, I'm sorry, instead we utilize a, um, yeah, a resistance framework which celebrates the ways in which incarcerated people transcend institutional um, oppression and trauma as a community using internal and collective resources. So James, you've mentioned um, the importance of everyday resistance among incarcerated individuals. Can you discuss how your book highlights these acts of resistance and the significance of these actions in the broader movement towards abolition and systemic change? Sure, so I want to I want to show a couple of slides from the book because that's one of the themes in in in, in the book is to show the sort of daily resistance. So I mean, I th there's different forms of resistance. I'm, I'm also kind of a labor historian. So in labor history, you kind of have what we call informal resistance, which is the ways in which workers push back against the bosses on a daily on a daily basis. Well, we do that in prison. We find ways to assert our humanity, to assert our creativity by using the resources that are available to us and by building relationships with other people that we are incarcerated with. So, you know, on Thanksgiving, on Christmas, what happens? You have a big spread. Now, it might look pretty, it might not look all that delicious to people in this room, but when you're inside and you see those big plastic bags full of squeezed cheese and, and rice and beans. It looks fantastic. Everybody's getting a bowl and you're, and you know, you're, you're, you're collectively enjoying and you're, you're, you're reappropriating that and making it and, and taking control of it, taking control of it. So we have a lot of visuals of some of the things that are in, that are in, uh, you know, that are part of that daily resistance, and then we can talk a little bit about more formal resistance like hunger strikes. But, so, Vic, do you want to talk a little bit? Because Vic hand drew all these things, so I think we need to appreciate, well, most of um, We have a slight technical difficulty, and while that's being figured out, if you have a book, I think it's on page 134, but don't quote me on that. If you don't have a book, it's on the monitor behind you. Um, I only drew the one that is painted, the tattoo gun. The rest are drawn by, An drawn by Angela. So if you want a whole book on prisoner in innovations, you should really check out that book. It's called Prisoner Innovations. Um, Angela was um, incarcerated at the time and is no longer incarcerated now. Um, so if you flip through this book, you're gonna notice that I'm pretty perfectionist because, well, it depends on how long you stare at each page, which I understand I stare at them for a lot longer than most people. Um, a lot of this book is hand-drawn, hand-painted by me. Um, the idea behind that is twofold. One, 
I believe that labor and energy is the way to hold vigil for, for honoring what you're talking about. Um, so for example, on the front cover, every figure is hand drawn. A lot of that has to do with trying to display this tension between the individual tragedy and, um, and the mass scale of it, right? So I, I, I think that's something that's really difficult to hold in your head is every t one of the two million is dealing with an individual tragedy worthy of a Shakespeare play, right? Um, so every figure is different. If you look at the, the picture of the silhouette, which is not on here, used to be, um, each one is also different. And another thing is that I wanted the book to fit within the world of prison art. So prison art is a beautiful, to me, one of powerful source of resistance. People make gorgeous pieces of art from things that they've uh, scavenged from like chip bags. Like for example, if you wanna look at um, Spitz's Diner, it's an example. Uh, this man made this incredible miniature of a diner using uh, chip bag pieces and also different other pieces and repurposing them, repurposing them. Um, and so I wanted the, the book to feel like it could have been made within that world, to feel like it was speaking to that world. Uh, so that's why I hand painted most of these diagrams. <laughs> um, yeah, and I, this is actually one of my favorite spreads, the prison innovations piece. I am realizing that this clicker is not gonna work, so if someone could do me the favor of, oh, brilliant, thank you. Um, and it, talk, it speaks a lot to the fight to maintain dignity and humanity within a system that so deeply wants to take that from you. Things as simple and, and clever as using M&Ms to stain your lips for when your family visits you, or using eyeshadow that is made from crushed color pencils. Another thing is that you can spread Vaseline on your cheek and then take a magazine spread that has the color you want and then rub that on. Um, which I think is beautiful and powerful. So, but I think we also, we also need to recognize that resistance is also mass action, right? That resistance is, the, the, daily, the daily resistance is important, but the formal resistance is also important. And I think the formal resistance is both, I mean, we've seen Pelican Bay hunger strikes, we've seen Free Alabama movement, but I think we also should consider the, the organizations that emerge in the community, particularly those that involve formerly incarcerated people, organizations like CCWP, organizations like FICPFM and so forth, that bring together formerly incarcerated people to take collective action to try to change the system, to abolish the system, to take on whatever needs to be taken on. And we can have lots of discussion about what's, what are the appropriate strategies, what are the appropriate organizational forms, and I think those are very important discussions, but we can't talk about dismantling the system, we can't talk about abolition unless we're talking about building organization. Absolutely. So looking forward, um, you know, given the current climate of criminalizing homelessness, war on drugs, political turmoil, and tough on crime efforts like Prop 36 in California that seeks to roll back progressive criminal legal reforms. What are your thoughts on the future of mass incarceration? Are we moving backwards? And if so, how can we address the root causes of these issues and move forward in a way that promotes true healing and accountability? Um, obviously, there's pressure to move backwards. I mean, we're we're seeing that we're seeing we're seeing we're seeing in some states they're they're building new prisons, they're repealing laws. So I want to talk a little bit about my T-shirt here, which is about the Pretrial Fairness Act in the state of Illinois where I live. So the Pretrial Fairness Act. I don't know how many how many people are familiar with the Pretrial Fairness Act. Okay. So the Pretrial Fairness Act was the result of. I'm, I'm going to give a slightly longer version of this story because I, 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 I want to I talk about it in a more nuanced way. So across the country, particularly in the 2010s, we saw the rise of bail funds, and, organ and people were organizing on the ground to pay the bail of people because people recognized that even being incarcerated for a day or two can fundamentally change your life. 
So the Chicago Community Bond Fund was one of the cutting edge bond, bail funds of, of the some 95 bail funds that emerged across the country. So the Chicago Community Bond Fund decided that it was good to get people out of jail, but it wasn't enough because a lot of times people were going, were going back and they weren't able to put enough resources into helping them change their life when they came out into the community in order to, in order to really fundamentally make a change. So what they, what they did is they initiated, a, they, they built a statewide coalition to eliminate cash bail in Illinois. And so they, they went around the, around the state. I mean, I live in Champaign. They had a forum in Champaign. They had a forum in different parts of the state to talk about the impact of, of cash bail. And ultimately, they got the state legislature to pass a law which eliminated cash bail in all but a few cases. So this is a major victory, right? The first state in the country to eliminate cash bail. But of course, what's happening now? The prosecutors, the judges are pushing back against this. The, the prosecutors, for example, there's a narrow spectrum of charges that you, can, that, you're, that you can hold people without bail, that you cannot release them. Otherwise, they have to be released within 48 hours. But the prosecutors are expanding that list of charges, stacking charges on people so they can, so they can come up with an excuse to keep them to keep them in. Judges are doing similar things. So we have to push back against that. And I'm just taking that as an example of how we had a major victory, which was a mass movement in the state of Illinois, which involved the, the elected officials as well, particularly the black caucus in the state legislature. But now we're having to push back against that. I'm sure there's people in this room that can talk a lot more about similar things happening in California and maybe in other states. So we have to recognize that when we win a victory, we, we better be prepared for the backlash. And I mean, I think for those of us who are involved in the movements of the 60s and 70s, we experienced all that, right? Mass incarceration is, is, is part of that. So we need to see how that back and forth uh, continues and how we continue to fight. I think another thing that is a little bit more abstract that James and I have been talking about for the last three days is there's this rise in talking about the golden prisoner, you know, this this like ideal Boy Scout of a person who is striving against all opposition to run the mile, for example, the movie um, 26.2 about San Quentin, about people who are running the marathon um, within pr the prison yard. And it's a feel good idea, right? It's a feel good idea to tell a triumph story of tribulations and someone who rises above. But at the same time, it doesn't, it distracts from the system itself and it leaves people behind. Like sure, you have that guy running the mile, but that guy watching TV also deserves to have freedom. Um, and I think that I'm wondering if it has to do with our fear and paralysis when it comes to confronting something so big. And I mean, I don't have good news, we still have to do it. <laughs> like, I'm so sorry. Um, and another thing is, I worry that we get bored too easily. I worry that we need these strong plot-driven narratives to believe in something. And personally, I think one of the most slippery things about mass incarceration is how much power there is in boring bureaucracy. and forms and parole violations. Like these are things that decide the layout of many lives. Like we don't talk enough about how the parole board is basically a court that reconvicts people except without a public jury, right? Um, and these are the things that we really need to have the patience and determination and stubbornness to take on. So I wanna just talk a little bit about that narrative that Vic referred to at the beginning. And that narrative is and I, I, I hear this, in, in, in that movie, 26.2, I don't know, has anybody seen that movie? Okay, I mean, I, I, mean, I have the greatest respect for people that are, that are doing all that running. I ran a marathon once and I vowed I'm never touching that again. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, but these guys are running around in circles in the prison and it's wonderful that they have that discipline. But what was, what was really hurtful 
in that movie was how many people when they were interviewed said, I'm here, it's all my fault because I'm here. I made a bad judgment, I, you know, I made a mistake. Me, 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 it's all my fault. And as long as we, as long as that narrative stays alive, everybody's gonna be blaming themselves. You're not gonna organize. People are not talking about the system or the fact that maybe you made a mistake but should you have gotten 30 years for that mistake? So there, there, that's, that's part of the pushback against the narrative that we've put out about mass incarceration, about the new Jim Crow, all of the things that we have put forward about abolition to, to put the blame on the system. And now part of the pushback is people blaming themselves. So, <clears throat> excuse me, in Champaign, I work in a reentry program uh, called First Followers, and we provide, we help people get jobs, help people get housing. But so many people walk through our doors, and the first thing they tell, the first thing they tell you is how they made a terrible mistake. And basically, they're telling you, "Well, I'm a horrible person, but I'm going to be better." And 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 that that is that's so destructive and so self-deprecating and demeaning and disempowering. So. I mean, I think we just, we need to push back against that narrative when, when, when we hear that. And I'm going to add on to that. Well, two things. One, I want to say I said golden prisoner because I think that narrative actually does remove the humanity out of people. Um, but in general, I believe we should be using vocabulary that honors the personhood of each person who is incarcerated, incarcerated person. Anyways, thank you for listening to my footnote. Um, Everyone's always so confused about how I wrote a book on masturbation and then wrote a book on mass incarceration. <laughs> I welcome any questions. I promise that, uh, you know, there's this joke about like, how many people do you need in a room to make sure that two people have the same birthday? Well, generally, how many people do you need in a room to make one of them uncomfortable by my work? <laughs> um, and, I wanted to speak to that. So uh, an essay that's very, very um, important to me is by Audre Lorde. It's on the uses of the erotic power. And what she says is that one of the most powerful things about discovering your own erotic power in your body is that it tells you that you were made to experience joy and pleasure in this world. That is something that was built in the foundation of who you are. And it is something that once you discover will color every part of your life. And that is something that we need to remember when it comes to things like mass incarceration. And that is something that is at the heart of the narratives we are told about why this exists. It is the idea that people are bad and they need to be punished. And the way to do so is to remove them from our communities to take them out because there is no way for us to figure out as a community how to work with people past trauma, past pain, past violence, past harm, and figure out how to reincorporate them. Yeah, absolutely. And um, James, can I go back to something you mentioned about narrative? Both of you mentioned narrative work and we're talking about how incarcerated people or from incarcerated people often like blame themselves. So one thing like I've seen, like even as a lifer, when you're going before the parole board, you're expected to go in there and take ownership and paint yourself as the worst person on earth, really, literally, in order to get your freedom. And I think a lot of people, like they condition their minds um, in, with that narrative in order to obtain their liberation. And I think that's the design of the system as well, right? And how it works, it works for people because people are able to go to board and, and, and spew this rhetoric about themselves and get their liberation. Whereas when we're um, trying to change narrative to the broader community, it's harmful, you know? Would you, I mean, what do you think about that? Yeah, I mean, I see, I mean, another thing, I think another part of that is the way in which our families and our visitors are treated by the institution. They're also treated like dirt, right? And so, the, and, and I mean, I've heard guards say, well, why would anybody want to visit you anyway? Who would want to love you? And so that whole piece of, of, of self-hate is part of what's baked into, the in, baked into the institution. And I think it's doubly 
intense in women's institution. I've been a women's institution, but I can imagine, you know, the way in which gender is 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 played out, and the and the extent to which you have, you know, male guards in 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 women's prisons, that has to be doubly uh, harsh in in women in women's prisons. Um, you know that that whole piece. I think also, so I've been working with the Parole Preparation Project in New York. Um, they're incredible. You get paired with someone on the inside working to prep for a parole board hearing. And you're with them for as long as until they get out. So not just one cycle, but however long it takes. There are a lot of people who've worked with the, the group for 14 cycles now. Um, the person I'm working with, uh, he, we just did about like two months of coaching for this interview. And we have to do it all through legal visits or legal calls because what they do right before the parole board hearing is they look at all of your call logs, all of your email logs, and if they see that you've been prepping for this, they're going to think of that as coaching. So that's going to count against you, which is ridiculous because if you think about it, I don't think anyone minds when you get coached for the SAT or like a college board interview. And certainly I think parole board has much more impact or the idea of like, we have to figure out this one question of how do you sound convincingly remorseful and not rehearsed? It's an impossibility. It's a 10 minute call. These people are paid $120,000 a year. They're usually cronies of the system. And it's on Zoom. Like, how the hell are you supposed to prove that you're a remorseful individual on Zoom? I can't even like have a conversation on Zoom. I, it's, it's insane. I, I also, I, I wanna just, for a minute, talk about how that how that impacts political prisoners, because we've seen so many political prisoners from the from the 60s and 70s who have done 40 and 50 years, and part of the reason why they're kept there is they refuse to play that game. They refuse to say I'm a bad person. I did terrible things, and and I and I deserve to be I deserve to be in solitary for 30 years. So, and people paid. People paid the price for that. And, and I think a lot of people that, that did support work for political prisoners tried to find a way, particularly I look at the Release Aging People, Release Aging People in Prison Project in New York, which has some political prisoners that work there trying to figure out how do you navigate that? How do you, how do you get people to be released without having them give up all their dignity and everything that they've stood for all those years? And I think, I mean, that's a complicated question. And I mean, I think there's probably people here that could talk you know, better than I can about it. But nonetheless, I think that's something we should think about as we talk about how do we get people out of prison and what do people have to do to get out of prison? Absolutely. Thank you, James and Vic, so much for sharing your expertise and experience. I wanted to see if there was anything additional that you wanted to share. You feel like it's important for folks in the audience to hear that we didn't already talk about? <laughs> okay, two things. One, I think it's really important. I've been saying this to every single group that we talk to. Um, I had to make decisions about which examples we showed in the book and depicted. And for me, it was really important to ask myself which decisions would sacrifice the humanity of the people we're talking about more just so that someone can learn about it, the extent to which the system dehumanizes someone. I do not feel comfortable taking any more humanity away from someone. And that is to say that a lot of what happens is that I, I think it's important for books to admit that there were subjective decisions made. There, you can go as horrible as you want when it comes to prison about things that happen in prison. I did not want to re-traumatize people. I did not want people to walk away forgetting that these were people that went through this. Um, that was really important to me. Secondly, I want to know what part of the book you remember the most. <laughs> not necessarily that you loved. You can also hate on it. I, I find hate... Well, it, it might be a little tough in front of people, but <laughs> it's very informative. No, so actually, I don't. If I had to choose one, I'm a visual learner, so I really enjoy the 
the, the pictures throughout. I enjoyed, I love history. I love learning about history. So I love the way in which they took you through history from presidents past to how they contributed to mass incarceration. But I think more importantly, I love the end. I think coming out of prison, I wasn't, I wasn't an abolitionist, you know? I didn't know what an abolitionist was. So I really love the end of the book where you're kind of teaching people and you're sharing like the difference between reform and abolition and, and giving examples of how folks practice it. I thought that that, was a, that is very strong and good, especially for folks who don't understand, because I know a lot of folks in prison don't understand. And I think like it, with them reading this book, they will gain, gain clarity and have an understanding um, of the difference. So that was, that was the thing I was gonna mention is, is the whole question of abolition versus reform. And I think one of the things we tried to put so one of the things I think people do with abolition is they treat it as religious dogma. And if you're not, if you're not pure, if you're committing sin by not following the dicta, the dicta of abolition, then you're, you're, you're useless. And I mean, I've been through all kinds of sectarian fucking politics, and I, I don't, I don't want to see that be replicated in, ab in abolition. We need to use abolition as a way to engage with people, to discuss what the system is like what, and what we do in certain places. Because I've had people tell me, well, I'm never going to fight to get somebody out of solitary confinement. That's, that's reformist. I'm saying, hmm, you've never been in prison. I'm going to fight to get people out of solitary confinement. You, you bet I will. That doesn't mean it's changed the system, but, I'm, but, I, but that's harm reduction. That's impacting people's lives, and that's, that's you know, being, tr being true to your, your, your convictions that you're, that you're talking about change, you're talking about, about, about liberation. So I'd, and I think one of the things that I like, and in, in, in I think there's a really amazing graphic that Vic did there where she looks at, I don't know the, what, what page it's on, and, um, but it, it, it's, it's on, but it, it's where she, she draws the space of a prison cell and what it would look like if you reformed it, that is you put it in a porcelain toilet and you had, I don't know, hot, you, know, you, you, you had a nice, you know, nice pillows and all that kind of stuff. Or how could you use that same space in a liberatory way that was, that was dev devoted to community, uh, to, to a restructure in the community in a way that was, that was going to you know, build prosperity and peace, right? And so I'm sure Vic could describe that, di that difference a lot better than I could. So, so I've, I've got another point I want to make, but do you want to add to that? But it's fun to hear you describe my work. <laughs> James is also colorblind, which is, I, I find very useful because then we know if the book is, it can be seen in, with different abilities. Um, the book can be photocopied, I'm telling everyone this, so you can photocopy it in black and white, which was one of my main arguments with a lot of the graph, graphs online about prisons, is that they require color coding. Um, but this also means that he didn't like the same portraits that I did that I <laughs> were in the book. Um, I actually think you covered it great, but I do realize we didn't talk about the portraits now that I say that. Right. Um, should we do that real fast? Or um, do you want to do your second point? Do you talk about the portraits and then I'm gonna do my other It's point. just one note. Okay? Oh, uh, sorry. sorry, do you mind going back like five slides maybe to, it, it, actually the one right, oh, you know what? It was there. I see what you mean, it's, no. Yeah, I do on Dolores. Oh, yeah, perfect. Okay, so throughout the book, we have a bunch of portraits of previously incarcerated activists like Dolores Canales. Um, and we commissioned a lot of currently incarcerated artists to do them, which I think brings a lot of life and voice to the book and also crucially creates a, a, a method for people who are currently living in the system to impact and affect the book. Plus it creates a, a lineage of previously incarcerated, currently incarcerated, and the narrative of activism. So the, the, the last point I wanna make is um, a concern that I have, and maybe it's because I'm embedded in the, in the organizations in, in Illinois. And the, and the concern that I have is that the focus of people that are dealing with mass incarceration is becoming narrower and narrower. And that people, that people are not easily connecting the dots between 
the problems that people coming out of prison or people in prison face with similar problems faced by other people in the community who are not touched by incarceration. And so when I think back, particularly the, the, the movements that I was associated with in South Africa, but also even in, in the earlier periods, people in South Africa built organizations, community organizations that dealt with housing, they dealt with food, they dealt with land, they dealt with prisons, they dealt with economic restructuring, they dealt with Palestine. So there was a, there was a, a, a political consciousness, a, which I would call an abolition or a revolutionary consciousness that sees the system in its whole. And what I've found, particularly when people get embedded in legislation, that their world can, can narrow and they stop thinking about other struggles. Now, I'm hoping, as horrible as, you know, as what's happening in Palestine is, we've seen some amazing mobilizations around this, and we've seen people begin to, to connect the dots in ways we haven't seen in, 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 in a long time. We've seen all these mobilizations from since 2000 against the WTO, Occupy, um, Tahrir Square, um, all of the, the um, mobilizations around uh, police killing of black people, but we haven't seen a sustained organization survive to continue those struggles and connect the dots of those struggles. So I'm, I'm, I'm trying to think about how to do that and how to, you know, yes, we have to fight against mass incarceration, but w as, 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 da as, as David Gilbert says, when I, I interviewed David Gilbert, longtime political prisoner, and I asked him, um, what about international solidarity? And he said, well, as long as you've got a prison industrial complex, you're not gonna be able to build uh, international solidarity. And you've gotta build international solidarity to get rid of the prison industrial complex. So connect, connecting those kinds of dots, I think is really important, is really important to, to broaden the way we look at mass incarceration. That is really about global racial capitalism, and we have to figure out how the pieces fit together, and then also be able to work in our own communities with that consciousness. That's right. Thank you both. Are y'all ready for questions from the audience? Okay. We will now take qu any questions from the audience. If <laughs> Things are coming. You can just, yep, raise your hand and bring the mic to you. Hi, I'm Mitra. Uh, thanks for this talk. It was really helpful and useful. Um, I'm curious how it was like to uh, write this book and have art for this book by people who are currently incarcerated. Like, were there fears of censorship or punishment for people helping out with this book? Or was it a, like a smooth sailing ride? Or just how was it overall, you know? James, James was pretty trepidatious, and I knew that there was a pretty big chance things wouldn't make it to us via mail. Um, I've had many instances where, for example, like mailing things with crayon, like crayon drawings into prison can be confiscated because there's a suspicion that there's some sort of substance in the crayons. Um, thankfully, we actually it all went off with a hitch. Well, minus like, you know, the normal amount of people who don't respond to emails timely, in a timely manner, um, which were mostly me. Um, <laughs> I'm kidding, I did okay. Um, yeah, I honestly think we, I was baffled by how, how easy it was. Um, the Justice Arts, Arts Coalition was pretty crucial to that. Right, that's true, that? good point. Um, the Justice Arts Coalition is this wonderful group that works with people who are incarcerated across the country, and many of the artists that we commissioned, we found through them. Um, and they exhibit art, they also create a network, you can buy art online, and the money will go to people's commissary, which is pretty great. Any other questions? Hi, thanks guys. I'm Jeremy. Um, I'm wondering, uh, one common 
theme that I think runs through a lot of the things that you talked about is like just ideas of good and bad, you know, morality and how it relates to, you know, 26.2 tries to draw a line and, um, you know, the whole parole issue and whether somebody wants to compromise on their own idea of like what was right and wrong that went on in their life versus what the system believes is right and wrong that went on in their life, right? And just, you know, and even as abolitionists, you know, having to deal with um, a sense of um, how to respond when people ask us, well, what about the people who really did something wrong and do they, quote unquote, deserve the same kind of abolition, you know, the same kind of freedom, all of these sorts of questions, it just feels like a, um, a, a common thread to me somehow. I was wondering if you could comment on that a little bit. I mean, yes, it's a common thread. <laughs> Uh, you know, these are these are the challenges that we face if we're trying to talk about abolition. We're trying to talk about structural change. Um, we have to take on the the structures, but we also have to take on the ways in which people internalize that. And um, you know, it's it's a lot of pushback. I also think that it exists on the same spectrum as the myth of American meritocracy, right? So you have to defend that idea that everyone can be successful and get rich. If you just work hard enough and you're obedient enough and you follow all the rules, once you start showing exactly how much people are suffering through absolutely no fault of their own, it all falls apart. And I think that's like part of why people are holding on so hard to this idea of people who are good, bad, deserving, undeserving. I mean, obviously that narrative is how you control people. If they think, if they, if they think they're sinners and worthless, then you, then you can control them and make them do what you um, want them to do. Also makes people scared to protest or resist. Right. Anyone else, any other questions? This isn't really a question, so if anyone else has a real question. I will defer to, okay, this is, thank, this is, I'm Diana, I'm from the California Coalition for Women Prisoners. Thank you all so much. Um, I just wanted to mention a couple of things. Uh, one is that CCWP does have a campaign now to um, close both, all of the women's prisons in California which does come up with those kinds of questions. We're trying to figure out ways to answer that actually speak to people and acknowledge that there are some people who may need some type of a safe environment, but that isn't a prison. It isn't a prison. That is not what keeps us safe. So, and the other thing I wanted to say to make sure that people know, and this, not gonna make a whole speech about it because I don't even have all the information, but people should, in this room should really pay attention to the propositions in California, this cycle, because there are some very dangerous ones like Proposition 36, so just do your searching because I can't run it all down now. Don't look into how bad Proposition 36 is. Rolling back on uh, many of the reforms, the positive reforms that have been made, like has been talked about. And the other one is a positive one, which is Proposition 6. And that is to abolish involuntary servitude in the state, of, in, in all prisons in California. And that was, that's a very hard one proposition that uh, folks in All of Us or None, a group of formerly incarcerated people that some of the people here are part of, they fought for very hard and were able to get this onto the ballot in, um, in November. And I can't see how people can vote for slavery, although I'm sure there will be. It may, it may be touch and go, but really that one, it would be wonderful to people and to spread the word and get people to vote 
for Proposition 6. So that's really my spiel, and thank you very much, and hope if there's any other questions, I didn't shut them off. Thank you. <laughs> any other questions? Well, can we give Vic and James another round of applause? I also, am I? Oh, yes, okay. I also just want to say that it's really special every time we get to give this talk in a public library because that's just such a juxtaposition of the best and the worst that the government can do. So thanks to the librarians. <laughs> Thank you all so much, and thank, thank you for, for your questions, challenging questions to keep us sharp, you know? I don't want people to, it's terrible to have somebody ask you a question, what was it like writing a book? Yeah. <laughs> so I really appreciate the thought you gave, and you, and you actually read the book, which is, isn't always the case with interviewers. Okay, we either, can't get so. too salty on Mike. We, we have to be gracious. <laughs> I want to thank everybody and thank absolutely our panelists for being here and Amina for leading the conversation. Um, some things came up too that remind me, um, ABO Comics is a organization here that deals with, uh, works with LGBTQ prisoners and all through art form and really help get money back to them. So they're a really amazing organization. Check them out. And of course, the William James Association. They're also going to be there tomorrow. Yeah. ABO Comics. OK, awesome. And they're amazing. They they're have, like the hardest working Oregon town. Yeah, they put up a gallery of all of the original art mm -hmm. from the book. The, like, for example, uh, the one uh, of Dolores, like all of the incarcerated art. Um, yeah, so they, do, they publish comic books um, of prisoners' artwork. A period, B, period, O, comics with an X. Um, yeah, they're amazing. And of course, the William James Association, who has the um, arts program. I'm blanking why I had it. Pro uh, remind me what the arts program name of William James. Uh, something in the arts. I completely spaced it out. I had it earlier. Both Vic and um, James' books are available at the public library. Yay. And there is a little QR code where you can find other books about abolition. Thank you all so much for being here today. James. Uh, just, so we are at ABO Comics tomorrow at 5 o'clock, which is 2520 Telegraph Avenue on the Go, other side of the bay. They're amazing. Yeah. All right, thank you all for being here.